one. Hello, everyone! Hi there! Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we nerd out big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I had dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC dedicated to the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and I have a PhD in microbiology, and I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also worked as a research specialist, and I'm currently working as an editor for a scientific journal. Uh, every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today it's our news week where we do an overview of papers that we've seen in the news or other sources to try to find an article that we want to cover next week in more detail. And next week will be our deep dive week where we take one of the articles we talk about today and we look at it a bit figure by figure to learn what it can and cannot tell us. So make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. You can follow along with any of the papers that we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet at us using the hashtag microTWJC hashtag. And boy, do we have a show for you today. We delve into some of the latest news about SARS-CoV-2, about what's, what it's doing in the heart, whether the new uh, variants are more likely to infect your pets, the intricate like machinery that make it allow it to replicate inside mm -hmm. cells, and of course, are vaccines safe to take during pregnancy? And also, we've got other cool news in microbiology about ancient viruses discovered deep in the permafrost, the secret lives of soil microbes, and finally, a discovery that some say could rival the discovery of CRISPR. Want to know more? Then watch on. <laughs> so our first paper is actually a fairly old one. It was published like a, a month ago, but I, when I was looking through some of the SARS-CoV-2 papers we covered, I realized we, we hadn't spoken about SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and pregnancy. Um, and of course, this is like an important an important um, thing because you know we want to uh, make sure that the most people uh, that can be protected from infection uh, are eligible to take these things. But uh, the way that clinical trials are designed, they don't always um, accept uh, what they would consider like risky groups or like groups that they don't want um, that they're afraid of adverse reactions to. So in a lot of the clinical trials, pregnant women were not included in their in the excluded criteria. Um, and it was only after uh, the vaccine was out there and then sort of high level recommendations from larger regulatory bodies said, well, we, we don't want to stop pregnant women from getting it. And this is like a tricky position to be in, I think, right? Like, I mean, we're maybe a few months into the vaccine rollouts in, in a bunch of different countries now. And so in some ways, people have already hit like if you were pregnant during this time, like you already had to make that difficult decision. Like, do you take the vaccine or do, without knowing like some of the potential effects or do you wait, right? Until like there was more information. And so I think it's important to know that um, many people have made that decision to take the vaccine even when pregnant. And uh, this study was done by collecting all those instances of people who uh, decided like the risk, the risk benefit analysis to them was like, oh, we will want to take this vaccine because I don't want to see what strange complication might come from SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then they made sure that those people that did choose to take it uh, were able to log their adverse reactions, if any, um, to the uh, to the vaccine and then also track the outcomes of those pregnancies. Uh, in relationship to whether or not people took the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, it's quite quite interesting because I mean it's one of those things that like we is essential that people like talk about because I mean people if we haven't tested up people are justifiably hesitant so it's good to have this data to hand so people can look look at it and uh, so one of the things that, that jumped out to me yeah. is that they looked at adverse reactions between pregnant and non-pregnant and and for a lot of them I mean. So for the majority of them, it seems to be slightly lower in the pregnant population, which is kind of weird. But yeah, uh, yeah, like I mean, that's... but nothing, nothing unexpected. Right? Yeah, I think that this is very um, usually when yeah people look at adverse effects, they're saying like, oh, is there anything that stands out? <laughs> Something new that you didn't see, or yeah, an increased uh, rate in one group versus the other. But it doesn't really seem like that's the case. No, I mean it is. It seems that they're all kind of in about this in the same range at least. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that people were very worried about was whether there's any uh, kind of abnormalities in the pregnancy. Like what, what, how will it help? Yes. It? And this does delve into that, and uh, it basically finds that there's not much difference between the normal incidence and things in the normal population. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the main. Yeah. 
take away from this paper is actually it's safe to take va a vaccine while you're pregnant. Yes. And I think this was stuff, I, as I said, like, you know, they, they didn't include pregnant women in the clinical trial to begin with because, you know, clinical trials, they don't want to deal with that variation. They want the drug approved. They don't want to have this potentially complex population enter their data set. Um, but, like, people do know stuff about having taken vaccines, right, like in pregnant populations from the past. Mm. And that's why these regulatory agencies would say, oh, well, you know, there's a clear benefit to taking this vaccine, um, so you should do it. And so that's why we have this data set even, right? I, I think that's sort of what I'm, um, what I like to highlight about it, which is, which is an interesting thing is that, you know, you can go on what you know from the past. You don't have to directly test it, right? You can right. say like, from what we know of vaccines in the past, they would be safe, right, with, in pregnant women because we don't see any effects. And so people did take on that risk and then went, um, and, and took the vaccine, but actually it was no risk because here in this post hoc analysis, we're seeing, oh, all those things were as, as the experts predicted, um, we, we can see the data. And so it, I think it's good to be like, uh, it's good information to feel confident that, um, the vaccine would be safe for you if you are, if you are pregnant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do feel like there could be better approaches to, to exploring this question, uh, that, yeah. But unfortunately, so, I mean, because no, but, of the nature. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's like, but I think maybe that's part of what I'm trying to like say about this is because that's that's embedded in the way that clinical trials are designed and the way mm. that they choose to execute them, right? That it sort of left a little blind spot in, 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 in people's data uh, understanding what would go on. And you could build your clinical trial to include pregnant women. And I think maybe that would be <laughs> a good thing to think about, like inclusiveness in clinical trials. Um, but, but, you know, this is where we are right now. And this is, this is how we came to this particular data that we see in front of us. Yeah. So I guess the main takeaway is, yeah, uh, vaccines are safe if you take, if you're pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. which I feel embarrassed about talking about because, uh, I mean, this is a threat that I'd never face, so I feel like I'm being kind yeah, of a, a I, I, patronizing and that's why I was douche, like, but... it's, an old, it's, an old, it's an old paper, older paper, and I guess it sort of slipped through because sometimes, you know, we only are interested in some things that are, like, directly affected to our lives, and, like, I guess this is maybe one of our blind spots. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so that brings us to the next paper, which is Effect of two inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccines on symptomatic COVID-19 infection in adults, a randomized clinical trial. So maybe this is another, like, blind spot potentially, right? Like, this is a vaccine that is not available in the countries that we're in. <laughs> right? mm. this, is, this is the Sinovac um, uh, vaccine. So the inactivated, yeah. these are, like, some of the first vaccines, actually, that were created against SARS-CoV-2 and widely used. Um, in, in China and other countries, um, we're just seeing, well, again, this is a bit older. In May, they published um, some <laughs> uh, results from their randomized clinical trials. Um, and you can see that they have pretty good results. Um, they're uh, usually, they're about like 70, 78%, 70% effective. Um, they have two different versions of the vaccine, I didn't realize. Uh, there are just, I think, different... Um, batches of the SARS-CoV-2 that they, they grew up and they inactivated. Uh, and I think they give them both, right? It's like a two-dose sort of scenario. Oh, I think they get, they give them separately. So uh, oh, okay. they, so that's why they can like separate the different effects. Because I think they isolate them from two, ah, two different yeah. people. And so they're ch testing out these two different strains to see which one's slightly better. Um, and they also like have different alum concentrations in them as well. There's a lot of thing. There's a lot of differences between them that make it quite hard to figure out what exactly is the thing that makes a difference in the immune population. So why is WIV04 being slightly uh, less protective than HBO2? Uh, and it's quite hard to figure that out because they they kind of constructed slightly differently. But mm. um, so like WIV04 has like five micrograms of alum in it, and and HBO2 has like four. And is that making a difference, or is it the fact that they were isolated from two different patients uh, right. who were infected with COVID? Or is it yeah, so? There's a, a lot of different things, but I think the important takeaway is, and also like what population the, the pop, there's population variance, and like if you expose like a certain population to a vaccine, and they might just through the nature of that population might have slightly different infectivity rates. So yes. it, the differences <clears throat> could, might not actually be like 
real. It might just be a, a statistical abnormality. So, um, mm-hmm. but I think the main takeaway is that yeah, these are safe and effective, and it's a shame it took like this long for it to be published <laughs> because so they're like they were like one of the old school type of making vaccines, and they should have been like the first ones ready and right. available. But um, yeah, yeah I it's think... sort of like in the absence of these publishing things, like I feel like the news too said a lot of random stuff sometimes about the vaccines. Like we, you don't know if this one works or like who knows about this. There's that doubt always cast on things. But like seeing the paper, I mean, for me, I guess it's like different audiences have different things that make them confident that like, oh yeah, that's like a good thing in the world. And seeing this, I'm like, okay, look, like this is this vaccine does work and people are using it. Like it, I don't know. <laughs> it is yeah. weird to just feel like. Because, again, this was some of the first, this is like the first vaccine that was given out. To see the the randomized control studies just now is, is strange. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would have been, been great. And it would have probably, like, made a lot of the other, like, more advanced vaccines look less, like, oh, we've got, we're working with these fancy things with mRNA. And someone's like, oh, we just, he, we just killed the bacteria, the virus, and just gave it. And that's just it's quite right. simple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, yeah. but again, I, I think maybe once like to highlight, like even with the modern, like modern fancy new technology vaccines that people have been getting, it's not 100 percent. Right. Just like this vaccine. And so um, it's only part of the response that like people should be taking in terms of uh, protecting themselves from COVID-19. And, you know, we're still there. I think I think it's uh, it's nice to see that uh, countries are you know, relaxing their restrictions now and people can do different things, but, you know, there are still certain high risk activities maybe that you can be cautious about uh, because like, I mean, I think we've, we'll probably, we've talked about here, but we've talked about in previous episodes, right? Breakthrough infections still happen. You don't want to overload somebody with complications, right? Somebody who's already mm. sick, they might still have complications from this disease. Um, those are just important things to keep in mind. <clears throat> Yeah, and I I agree, and also I I think that Sinovac is great because it is accessible to a lot more people than especially the yeah. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and and oh, it's been doing. Oh, because they need the cold, the cold chain, right? I think that's yeah. a really good point as well. <laughs> like this old school version of vaccines, like don't have that difficult logistical requirement of um yeah being distributed by planes and minus eighty freezers and stuff like that. And <laughs> it's great because there's lots of people who are de- who are developing their own versions of heat killed bacteria. So I think, and it's not bacteria, viruses. I keep getting that wrong. <laughs> viruses. I did a, yeah. <laughs> d- a ten years of a degree and I still get that wrong. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, th- like I th- there's a lot of people doing th- this sort of work, and I think that this kind of adds more like kind of uh, security to people who are taking like vaccines that are based off of like uh, inactivated viruses. Yeah, absolutely. Um just to show that yeah it's it, it can be just as important tool i mean we we pointed out i think maybe two news things ago that there was an, a new mrna vaccine that didn't do so well in the trials right yeah and like how that sort of like people might have gotten very uh blinded during this uh, pandemic like when the listening to the news and hearing like oh my god new vaccine technologies and thinking like oh it's all about the technology right that's like pushing yeah. us forward but really like sometimes the old technology is pretty good too and um the communications is difficult like the world's a big place and like people have different priorities to who they're going to reach but uh for us seeing this yeah I, I agree like um it can it can give confidence to those people who have taken vaccines like this or if you're in that industry and you're like i'm making vaccines in these ways like this is still a very viable method yeah i mean i feel like i especially like this has been a thing that first of all i do worship technology a lot and (laughs) and i've been like with the new vaccines i'm like oh wow this is such amazing technology but i mean does it matter all it matters is whether it works or not uh (laughs) yeah um yeah so how how do you get out to people i mean all these other factors right just as we we briefly skimmed over here the whole um, cold chain sort of dependency is also like an important factor. So even these vaccines can have strategic benefit in certain scenarios over some of the higher high technology, let's call them high technology ones or like the newer technology platforms. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, bring us to our next paper, which is called Cardiomyocytes Recruit Monocytes Upon SARS-CoV-2 Infection by Secreting CCL2. So, <laughs> yep. Um, so 
I feel like we've talked so much about all the different tissue types that SARS-CoV-2 infects, and that that's come with discussions of like the uh, different receptors that it might use. Well, in this, we're looking at the next the next tissue of interest, uh, cardiomyocytes, which is the contractile tissue inside of the heart, so the thing that does the beating. Um, and they look at in human heart samples from autopsies as well as inside of hamst a hamster model, and then they do a cell culture model as well. Um, and they show that, yes, SARS-CoV-2 gets into these cells, and it produces a specific immune profile that recruits uh, macrophages. <laughs> And so that might be relevant because that could explain some types of heart symptoms that would uh, occur, right? And uh, recruiting macrophages into the tissue, as they say here, pro-inflammatory macrophages means um, lots of different emokines and things being spread around, uh, causing um, the innate immune system circuits, right, to fire off. And um, uh, I guess they, they, they focus on like caspase, I think. Yeah, they focus on like caspase expression, which which is like this inflammatory response. Um, yeah. Uh, so, the, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, this is quite an interesting paper because, uh, I mean, partly because it shows like the way we do look at like some science where we start off with a, uh, an animal model like hamsters and hamsters have been a mm -hmm. pretty good model for SARS-CoV-2 during this outbreak. And then we move into yeah. like human autopsy samples where we can see like kind of the outcomes but then like you move into cell culture where we can actually test things and figure out like kind of the kind of how each bit links together. And yeah, they yeah, link like uh, using these three lines of, of these three models, right, to give us different insights over the same disease. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know what else. What I have not written down on to write to say about this one because I think that the thing that I was in, interested in is. Uh, yeah, uh, they they basically say that although although like the cardiomyocytes do suffer damage, they find that the actual presence of macrophages does reduce the number of SARS-CoV-2 in infected cells, which is interesting. But I feel mm. like is kind of we'd rather have those those cells intact than than the SARS-CoV-2 eliminated from them. I think it's one of those things where the the yeah. benefit cost benefit analysis of having the immune response being so hyperactive is kind of quite like visible here. Um, so it's yeah, it's quite interesting yep. in that kind of respect. I, and that's a that's a really that's a really that's a very useful observation as well from these. Um, we probably say this a lot, but right, disease has equal components, right? The um, intervention from the the pathogen and the immune response, and that tuning the immune response to not be too much because too much immune response can cause uh, tissue damage, right, and and then lead to some sort of symptoms, and and we've seen that in the way that um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is treated, right. Sometimes people use some that in, suppresses inflammation, right. The the use of steroids, right, really early in the in the phase to try to suppress something, but maybe not later. This is um this is part of the complexity, I guess, of of disease and understanding where treatments can have the best impact. Yeah. Um, now we're going to move on to a little bit more molecular with SARS-CoV-2, where we're going to be looking at uh, transient and stabilized complexes of NSP7, NSP8, and NSP12 <laughs> in SARS-CoV-2 replication. So, uh, uh, yeah, we we basically like focus a lot on the structural things of how viruses work, and the interesting mm -hmm. thing here is uh, looking at what, what the virus bits do inside the cell. So it. A long time ago, we did a show on replication organelles, how like SARS-CoV-2 kind of tricks your body into making its own special organ just for creating SARS-CoV-2. And yeah. this kind of looks uh, like at the enzyme's shape. So SARS-CoV-2 produces all these little enzymes that are designed to like take over your cell. And this kind of delves into <laughs> that and looks at like kind of it looks at how they shape shift because the thing about viruses is they have to be very like that they they only have a certain amount of like length of the genome and they have to do as much with it as possible so often like mm -hmm. you have to have proteins that do more than one thing and so these proteins kind of shape shift in order to do different things in in the in the body which is uh quite interesting yeah. and they also use this um yeah really interesting technique called small angle neutron scattering which is very much seems like a very physics technique where there's like point a beam of neutrons uh, at something and measure the angles to to figure out like the shape of the the molecule and uh yeah it's actually very similar to crystallography in some ways right like yeah where you're you point some like radiation source against um 
against a molecule or in, in crystallography a crystal of those molecules and then based on the way that the light scatters off of it you can figure things out but i think the the advantage with sacks is they do it in solution so like these these um these proteins that they're trying to figure out the confirmation of they're not like trapped in some sort of crystal right which is what you do for crystallography they're just floating around and so they can they can detect things like uh, transient uh, like intermediate complexes where you have like a, a few things clumped together that then fall apart at different concentrations um, and that's what they report in this particular paper um, some of those dynamics I guess of uh, the way that these three proteins come together and, and, and bind to RNA I think is the important thing but this is part of the uh, replication transcription complex so the actual machinery that's touching the genome and um, replicating it. These proteins are involved in some way. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, it's very biophysical, so it's a little bit out of our reach, but I think if someone's quite interested in how the molecular machines of SARS-CoV-2 work, this would be a good paper for you, for you, the audience, to delve into, if you like. Um, yeah, and I think, I think the fact that you brought up that we'd spoken about the replication complexes the membrane bound replication complexes also from the view of structural biology <laughs> like maybe some time ago mm. um, and that was like a pore I think that we were looking at yeah and so just this interesting way of getting to understand um, getting to understand what's going on by directly observing I guess and so uh, you want to see the molecules and like what do they touch what, what, what do they look like what are their shapes can give people insight into, give scientists insight into what's happening in the infectious, yeah, in, during infection. Yeah, uh, definitely. So that's one to look out for. Um, next paper is analysis of SARS-CoV-2 variant mutations reveals neutralization escape mechanisms and their ability to use ACE, recept ACE2 receptors from additional species. So we've seen quite a, a lot of papers about variants over the past like few months. Like every time there's a variant, there's yeah. like a bunch of papers. And at this point, I've kind of like, it's, I mean, admittedly, the same reason why I've stopped like looking at vaccine papers is because I've kind of lost a little bit of interest in them. Like there's just so much yep. stuff out there. But this one caught my eye because it doesn't just look at, so it looks at the current variants, but also looks at them in the context of, of animals that, and other additional species that can get infected by them. So um, mm -hmm. they look at... Like... Yeah, so I, wait, I want to just take a <laughs> pause for a second and say, yeah, like, I, I agree with you that we've seen such a long list. I, maybe other people who follow the SARS-CoV-2 news will also feel this way, <laughs> right? Where it's like, oh my goodness, like, uh, yet another variant. And then scientists have gone with convalescent serum and monoclonal antibodies to show that it doesn't bind as well or binds just as well. And then, and then, and it's just presented, right? This long, like, just a conveyor belt because the, the virus is always mutating. We want it, we need this data to understand, like, how does that affect immunity? And so there's like, a conveyor belt of information. But where does that bring us, right? I think that that's, this is the frustration I'm feeling. It's like, what more can we say than, like, oh, like, it like, seems like it reduces this, these metrics of immunity, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to um, the actual immune response in the body. Like, how do we continue talking about that data in, in a way that might give us different insight? And I think this paper does that, and it, it does that by linking it to the use of ACE2 receptors, alternate ACE2 receptors in other cell types yes. or other organisms. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I think that, yeah, that you, you, you're right on the money there, because, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I've been scooping, because I guess normal people who don't, like, pay like so much attention to every single variant that comes out don't see the pattern of like someone going oh yeah we found a new variant convalescent serum doesn't neutralize it but then like a month later <laughs> vaccine serum neutralizes it and it's like okay well you, you gave us a heart attack yeah. for no reason <laughs> um but <laughs> this one is yeah. yeah yeah so yeah this connects the dots to like some of the mink outbreaks we saw earlier on in in the sars cov2 like kind of epidemic where like various mink farms got heavily infected and actually like a lot of the new variants have expanded host range by the looks of it, but the way they can infect the mouse and the mink better than they could before, which is an interesting aspect of mm -hmm. evolution that I haven't really thought about before, where, like, we always think about, like, vaccine, like, kind of, like, uh, how variants develop will be in relation just to humans and re and making being better at infecting humans. But actually, we, we, have, we have other animals in our environment who also get infected by SARS. So, uh... So it could yeah. be a lot of these adaptations we're seeing could be 
adapting to other other animals as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that that's a really, yeah, interesting uh, uh, interpretation, right? Of 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 all this, all these um, all these mutations out there. It's uh, it it. I think it does also impact human health as well because these are reservoirs, right? That uh, that were created. It potentially we're creating viruses that are more adapted to specific animal reservoirs of SARS-CoV-2. And I mean, although the trajectory doesn't seem like we're going for elimination of the virus globally, um, uh, arguably, you know, I mean, you can argue for whether that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, I can also say that like this is, we're, we've left the door open as well to creating more opportunities for these types of zoonotic um respiratory viruses to flow back and forth <clears throat> yeah um for sure so this is interesting it's kind of a bad news thing it's kind right? of a bad news <laughs> thing mutations are, mutations are still kind of a bad news even if they aren't directly affecting human health like they might be uh just priming the world to be more you know respiratory virus friendly <laughs> like more of a, a breeding ground for different zoonotic respiratory viruses <clears throat> yeah uh, so that's kind of a, a doomer interpretation of that, I think. I mean, I, 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 I just okay, too, too much doom. Yeah, too much doom. We need. We we've lost all of our viewers now. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I really do think that this is interesting for the fact that, like, because yeah, a full elimination strategy might be very difficult to do, especially the way that people are talking talking about it. But I think like mm -hmm. keep, keeping an eye on like. Reemergences from other populations, other than say bats, just looking at domestic animals that are out there. I think it mm. might be a good idea to keep an eye on that and for the future. Um, yeah, I'm curious about like where this. I mean, this is just this is just strange news information now. Like I'm trying to integrate news stories into this particular observation or this story that people are telling with mutations in this paper. Mm. Like, what's up with mink farms these days, <laughs> right? Like. Are they still hot? Are they still getting cold at some level if they find outbreaks, or are they just like maybe that industry is kind of dead for a, a period of time? Um, what other what other animal industries might find that have a right that have a two we need to be monitoring, I guess, um, for for potential outbreaks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we I guess I'm guessing like well. Because I know that mink and ferrets were like unusual, unusually susceptible because of that, especially new new mutations that were later seen mm -hmm. emerging in like other other strains. Um, but I mean, so far I haven't seen anything relating to like because we'd have to be really worried if it was livestock or like farm animals. I think that, and right. I, I'm I might have seen something like that, but I don't I don't know. I can't quite remember. Uh, I'm yeah. sure that if you've yeah. seen like anything in the out in the uh, any farm outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2, then pop up in the comments, and we all get suitably frightened because of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, or also just like try to take it apart a little bit better to understand, like, right? Yeah. Like, what are these reports getting at, um, and how does it relate to to mutations and and potential zoonotic transmission? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's basically, I need to, I need to know this paper so I can decide whether I'm gonna finally become vegan or not. Just well, is that gonna be, is this gonna be the tipping point? Um, <laughs> Okay. No. Um, yeah, I think I think I, I really liked. I thought this was an interesting paper from that perspective of just another take on seeing this yeah <laughs> list of mutations and whether or not convalescent serum or monoclonals work on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So next we're going away from SARS-CoV-2 and talking about ancient viruses. Yes. So uh, glacier arch so glacier ice archives nearly fifteen thousand year old microbes and phages. This gives me thing feels, right? That movie, The Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not like hopefully not like some object that takes over your body, but like microbes and phages from from the past. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I'm getting that thing. Like, oh no, we've unleashed another ancient virus. Let's we've already got like like I had this like reported new the news stories, and I think a lot of people are like, oh no, not again. We don't want. <laughs> but but actually, this is uh, quite a fascinating thing because it isn't about. So I think the key thing word is phages, and phages. What we think about phages is when uh, is viruses that affect bacteria specifically, and uh, it's mm -hmm. quite a cool paper. Not just because it's got a really fancy video abstract, um, but um, but also because uh, it, it's investigating a question I think we've been touching on over the past few shows on like micro on bacteria and their relationships to phages. 
So uh, mm -hmm. effectively, like uh, these places are kind of repo natural repositories for viruses and bacteria that exist in the atmosphere. And so they usually build up in atmospheric snow. And some say that bacteria cause atmospheric snow as well. And like mm -hmm. layers at the bottom are older, layers at the top are new. So you can actually see a timeline of phages and bacteria as they're evolving. So you can see, so they, they did some sequencing to identify the, the bacteria in these ice cores and also the phages that predated on them. So yeah. um, it's so you, what I really so, liked about. Oh, go, go no, ahead. You, you, you go ahead. I just, I just want to say one of the things I really liked about this when I was flipping through the figures of this paper is they, they talk a lot about how they are making sure that they get the pure ice and not contaminated from other microbes. Um, and this is big. It, whenever you're talking about like ancient, right, like sort of uh, when you're looking for something uh yeah, ancient, I think. Like, this comes into play also with, like, ancient DNA for, for like, uh, mammalian DNA and stuff like that. Like, uh, the sample processing is such an important pro part of how you approach this because you can imagine if you're using a, met a method like PCR, which is very sensitive to uh, any little bit of DNA, you want to make sure that you're not amplifying stuff from you because <laughs> mm. we're covered in bacteria and phage and microbes. Um, and they actually did um, like side by side testing here where they doped in a uh, contaminant, right? Like a, a fake contaminant, uh, and saw like in their different processing uh, methods whether or not uh, those methods were able to exclude the contaminant from their final uh, PCR sample. <clears throat> yeah, and that is, I mean, that's a really important thing. The, the actual process of doing science is so, so important and it's part of the things we read scientific papers for. Uh, and mm. uh, I'm just going to, and also it means that you've got clean, clean samples and we can see this wonderful timeline of of, uh, of various bacteria and the phages that pr prey on them evolving over time. So uh, if you think back to like a couple of sessions ago, we we're talking about like co-evolved phages, which was effectively doing the same experiment, but in a test tube in a laboratory. <laughs> Uh, but this is like a natural version yep. of that same experiment where they're looking at where, where before they're looking at how phages are co-evolving with bacteria here we can actually see how it happens in nature which is a really interesting idea um so uh yeah the, the thing that's the of course they they don't actually um do any like head to, like they're not um these archived phages and bacteria, they're not able to grow them and then test. I think they're just looking at genomic sequences that like help yep. yeah, show that they're associated with each other, something like that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. They they didn't actually resurrect these vir these bacteria or viruses. All they had were DNA samples. So unfortunately we we have avoided another apocalypse, which is uh, <laughs> I'm sure very disappointing to all you doomers out there. Uh yeah. <laughs> But what it can potentially give us, even with that DNA, like so, these DNA samples, it can potentially give us a better understanding of phage and bacterial evolution, which should be quite interesting for all the all the studies we've been talking about about phages and phage therapy. Yeah, and I think also we sort of talked about this before, but also just understanding evolution in general, like what are the yeah. types of um, what what are the types of things that can happen in evolution if we know that these two systems, phage and bacteria, are being are you know some sort of predator prey relationship and then you can see how their abundances might change over some period of time by like going to the different ice cores right and saying oh it's, the abundances are changing over time um yeah what is that what can that tell us about just evolution in general i think that that's maybe part of the usefulness of data sets like this <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah, very, very interesting. Ancient viruses, not quite as scary as we th as we thought it was when we first saw, but still interesting. <laughs> um, next, we next is a is an interesting story about a very interesting organism as well. There are these uh, sea slugs that live in the sea, as you know, but they they eat algae algae and they steal like chloroplasts from them. So when they eat an algae, they absorb its power and become photosynthetic. So the, these slugs can yeah. make energy from the sun by eat so it sounds like a, a a bad superhero like origin story where <laughs> someone well, just ate too much fruit and they became a plant <laughs> this is I, the title threw me off when i first read this because i was like why did they have to specify without gene transfer but i guess because there are some organisms that pick up right the the genes to make chloroplasts but this is not that instance this is very much just 
they take the chloroplast themselves from the things that they eat, and instead of digesting it, they keep them in their own private <laughs> private uh, cell type vacuole, and then just have them do photosynthesis for them. Yeah, and this is an interesting thing because people, because I mean, we have chloroplasts, we have my, my, well, we don't have chloroplasts, but plants have chloroplasts, but they're kind of mm -hmm. like mitochondria. Like where they're bacteria that used to be free living, and then they're, they're, now they're in symbiosis. And uh, there's a lot of like interplay because some people with mitochondria, there's this idea that the, a lot of genes from mitochondria are in the nucleus, and there's a lot of like kind of regulation required. Mm -hmm. So uh, plants also have that where they've got like various genes in the nucleus that help regulate chloroplasts. And so the mm -hmm. idea was okay, the plant needs these genes in order to keep those chloroplasts alive. So the question is mm -hmm. okay, so how are these animals which don't have those genes keeping them alive? Because, mm. so, and there's yeah. this idea that, okay, maybe these animals at some point had some gene transfer, that they stole some of the genes from plants in order to do that. But what they've actually been finding is that these chloroplasts uh, don't need, didn't need that. They just need a certain environment in order to survive. Um, so. Yeah, but this could be, this could be like the, the, the route in which, right, like, um, this, these types of genetic exchanges could happen. I, that, that's what I'm thinking, like, just yeah. knowing that there is a way this could represent like some this was an ancient form right of of that symbiosis and then sometimes it gets closer some strange event happens right and then natural selection acts on it gets closer i think it's fascinating to me like the pictures here in like figure one just how many chloroplasts the slug actually keeps right like this is not an insignificant amount it's enough to dye the tissues of uh, the sea slug green and you would think that it just made it themselves but it's all just from their diet and it's not algae that's sitting in there it's the chloroplasts inside of slug cells <laughs> yeah they have special cells called kleptoplasts whose entire function is to steal chloroplasts from plant cells that it's digesting yeah which is and i love uh, that they made them kleptoplasts yeah <laughs> they're just stealing chloroplasts yeah just stealing <laughs> chloroplasts it's it's a fun little like kind of jaunt into because I mean for for a minute there I was looking at this and thinking okay this is kind of like on the edge of microbiology because uh, chloroplasts are their yeah. organelles so they kind of fall into cellular biology but I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say that yeah we're gonna cover this because in this case it kind of shows that chloroplasts are a lot more free living than than what you'd expect so uh, yeah I'm yeah. gonna they... plant a flag for microbiology <laughs> in this paper even though it's about sea slugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are sort of expanding the bounds of microbiology here. But again, I think horizontal gene transfer, right? Like, where do chloroplasts come from? How do, like, these types of close close symbiosis occur? Like, that is definitely in the bounds of microbiology. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this, is the cell, this is the cell biology or the organismal biology that bridges that. And, um, yeah, I, I think that it can tell us stuff about that, that history. Um, that we know has happened in the past. Yeah, for for sure. So that's chloroplast acquisition without gene transfer in kleptoplastic sea slugs, Plecobranchus oscillatus. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, and going on to we're still on the kind of topic of like uh, mutualisms, I guess. So in vitro symbiosis of reef building coral cells with photosynthetic dinoflagellates. So corals, they they're photosynthetic, but like the sea slug we just talked about. They pull out diatoms and dinoflagellates from like the column, from and they yeah. they. Well, this this is the this is the whole they they symbiose with the whole organism. Yeah. So they don't just steal the organelle from the algae. Yeah. They they live with the organism itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think this this one caught my eye because with with all the talk about the heat dome that were that that happening, there's a lot of been worry about like coral bleaching events, which is what happens when when corals yeah. like temperature get gets very high and their symbionts start producing lots of like reactive oxygen like they, the, the symbionts the little like kind of dinoflagellates that live with them start behaving badly and their relationship like goes wrong and the coral just ejects mm -hmm. them completely causing these corals to bleach yeah. and um one of the and sometimes corals can recover from that by taking on new symbiotes that are more like more stable with the current environmental conditions i think usually it's meant to happen like gradually but because of the dramatic changes heat it happens like all at once um mm -hmm. so i'm so i'm not an expert on this obviously I, there's a lot more like kind of nuance to to this there's lots of different reasons why corals bleach but this one interested me because mm -hmm. what they do is they take coral cells and they uh 
and uh, mix them. They grow them in. <laughs> mix them with dino flagellates. So they, yeah, they take take dino flagellates and they grow them in like um, uh, in a lab, which is something that isn't often done. They, you don't, we don't have any very many models for for coral like yep. bi- biosis in a lab, and what they do is they manage to like get these corals to take up dino flagellates, uh, which I think is like something that quite an important thing because if we want to reverse coral bleaching we want to be able to to be to like kind of re-augment bleach corals with the kind of symbiotes that they need to survive in kind of a new environment yeah and i think it's about understanding that mechanism more closely yeah. because like we know that that's what happens on this grand scale but how do you understand like the molecular mechanisms that underpin that right if you're gonna make some sort of how do you modify dinoflagellate so that it could get back into that coral or how do you, you know, treat the corals so that they're more accepting of dinoflagellates in their area after such an event. Um, and you, you could do that with whole corals, I guess, but of course it, you can work faster sometimes when things are in an in vitro system. And if it has some sort of relationship to that, you know, like this is why people use cell culture, right? Because it's just easier to work with. You can, try a lot of different things, learn something about the biology, and then relate it into, take that model and relate it to the bigger organism. And uh, that's that's what I think this paper is bringing to the table, is that it's identifying a potential model that you could um, work with in the lab that might be a little bit easier to work with than the whole corals, that you could learn something really relevant because they're actually observing these events that we always say happen in the whole organism inside of these like single cell, these cell-cell interactions. Yeah, exactly. I think I don't think I can put it any better than that. So I'm going to move on to the next paper, which is called "Teamwork in in the Viscous Oceanic Microscale." Uh, back to cell cell interactions, but still in the ocean. <laughs> uh, this time, still with dinoflagellates in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, this time we're talking though about diatoms, and so it's well known that I mean, you know. Even in like uh, crab shells or whatever, you get scum built on top of things. Like, mm. you know, life always grows on other forms of life, even our bodies, right? Like, we have stuff growing on us all the time. But even at this tiny scale, when you're talking about a single, like, photosynth or yeah, not photosynthetic, but single um, diatom floating in the ocean, you can have small organisms attached to them that cycle the fluid around so that have cilia and they're like trying to feed their filter feeders so they like spin the fluid around and in this paper they um they look at i guess the biophysics of that just zoom in to the surface of one of these tiny diatoms that have um some cilia attached and they say oh wow like these cilia help the diatom uh, get more nutrients because that cycling action um, sort of mixes the mixes the fluid around them easier. Um, and so, yeah, it's like a really fun story uh, about just uh, how you can have this very, very close symbiosis, almost just, yeah, just biophysical symbiosis um, that that lets one species be more successful. I guess the team be more successful. Yeah, it's really kind of cool. You've got these, like, diatoms, which are kind of... Basically, like, they, they make natural glass around themselves, and mm-hmm. and they photosynthesize, and then they've just, like, got these, uh... uh yeah, these these mushroom-looking things with hairs on them that... I mean, this... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's just... It, I mean, here, you can see, like, the they're spinning around. These things oh. are, like, how they're cilia. It, I mean, this is wild. This is the sort of thing I'd expect, like, David Attenborough to narrate while, while there's thrilling music going on this is i mean yeah so many like there's so many uh cool videos in this paper (laughs) and yeah and i i think it's uh it's a strange thing to think about as well like they focus about it in the in the title and this is going to be applicable even when we think about bacteria and things at this scale but when you get really small like water doesn't Water is actually very sticky. Yeah. (laughs) It's not something that you think of as, um, like, we think of water, like, flows over us and it, like, washes away and it, like, takes things away. But when you're really small, that surface tension um, uh, is a a big factor. And and actually, you don't, diffusion is slow. (laughs) You don't, things don't just diffuse really quickly. Um, And that's an important 
point to keep in mind when we're thinking about how organisms live in these areas, that those tiny hairs that are moving things around are performing really important functions. And for an organism that's bigger, uh, you know, having, I guess, small symbiotes that are able to move that liquid uh, is super important for being able to get exposed because oceans are not um, nutrient rich, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're actually pretty uh, dilute. And so they, uh, to be able to survive in such an environment, you want to have a lot of flux. You want to be able to see a lot of stuff across your surface. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because if you're trapped in like just the sort of not so nutrient rich area and you don't see a lot of um, that liquid around you, then you don't get a lot of nutrients. And so this is like a really important part of living in the ocean, actually. Yeah, this is uh, quite fascinating. Um, and again, very biophysics-y, but it has quite a lot of... Very library. biophysics, right? It, it, yeah. <laughs> it's just saying that if these things want to have a lot of stuff moving around them, it would benefit them to have... It benefits them to have tiny organisms that also move liquid <laughs> on their surface. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, now let's let's move to the next one, which I, is uh, Drosophila antimicrobial peptides and lysozymes regulate gut microbiota composition and abundance. Yeah, I mean, this is a classic uh, sort of microbiota paper when you say, let's look at the microbiota of some gut. How is that formed, right? Like, we know that it's not just the chance. I mean, of course, chance plays a big role in terms of, like, the types of um, organisms that grow there, but the biology of the organism also has some effect. And so in order to interrogate this, they have to make germ-free <laughs> germ fruit flies. Drosophila is a fruit fly. It's a workhorse of the lab laboratory. Um, they make germ-free versions, and then they uh, add different micro different microbiota to those germ-free versions, and they see um, in different mutants of those uh, Drosophila how the microbiota changes and finds its stable form. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and it's it's great because I mean, with invertebrate immunity, I feel like antimicrobial peptides play a lot bigger role than say in in our immune system, um, or at least yeah. the way they act is slightly well, different. I was going to say, I'm not really sure. I think we just have a lot more immune stuff going on. So uh, a lot of the phenomena gets explained more by that cellular immunity component yeah. and humoral immunity. But we also have antimicrobial peptides, right? Yeah, so we, we do. Uh... It, it could be that they play a role, but it's not such a big role. But because inside of the drosophila gut they don't have some of those other big actors this becomes these 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 molecules become the big players in forming the microbiota yeah so i mean i haven't seen much uh, so yeah this is quite an interesting paper and in looking at yeah something i'd never really thought about as a but drosophila are a good model for looking at that for and like kind of a pared down model yeah. i think that's the idea yeah yeah you can ask you can ask much like bigger questions with much more simpler models because like drosophila like the, what the generation time is maybe like a few weeks or no six days apparently to get to full full growth so <laughs> right and then and considering too that we have control over the drosophila genome to be able to make knockouts right so that lack certain antimicrobial peptides and say how does that affect the composition of the yeah of the microbiota i was looking at the methods they they, they prick the thorax with needles that have these particular microbiota on it to see like to i guess uh, uh, <laughs> infect them uh, but that just sounds like such a <laughs> in-depth under the microscope process pricking drosophila abdomens with uh, a needle that's been dipped in some microbes. <laughs> oh, God. yeah. Uh, I mean, story time here. That's like something that happened in our lab where we had to like infect not not Drosophila but wax moths, lo wax moth larvae. Oh yeah. Where you basically Scary. have to like inject it into the so wax moths have like air holes all over their sides, so you have to like be able to like drop your back. Your your kind of bacterial solution into the spiracles, mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's insect uh, models are wild to work with. Um, mm -hmm. So let's move on to a different thing. So uh, not that one. Uh, structure guided microbial targeting of anti staphylococcal prodrugs. So this is uh, this is about so yeah another way to create more antibiotics is this the idea here is to effectively like camouflage an antibiotic as something else. 
so the bacteria will take it up. Um, so that's kind of a very specific yep. thing because uh, lots of an- there's, lots of way- there's lots of ways that bacteria can become antibiotic resistant, and one of the ways is by simply pumping out uh, antibiotics from the cell. Uh, and mm-hmm. so this focuses specifically on a, a phosphonate type anti antibiotics, things like phosphomycin. Uh, so th- those are quite they're okay antibiotics, but they can't don't get into bacterial cells very well. They're not very bioavailable. So what they did mm-hmm. do here is they investigate the idea of of camouflaging. So ad- ad- so taking these like biomolecules, attaching it to a different one that makes it look slightly different to the bacteria in a way that will make it take it up, and then. Inside the bacteria, the bacteria's own metabolic processes will cleave that uh, that that drug into two and hmm. make it making it active. So effectively, it's like like has it like a little invisibility cloak on it, and then it like kind of like saddles into the the bacteria, and then the bacteria itself unleashes it, and then it all all goes crazy. It comes yeah. comes like the last yeah. And what's it, interesting it, is that they're designing this particular function, which I think is so strange. So they they know enough about the structure of these molecules and the enzymes that are inside of the bacteria to say that oh like we should try to approach this in this way <laughs> we should add these strange sequences here to to make it work yeah and uh, the thing that interests me about this is it kind of like calls back to probably the oldest theory of antibiotics so before and alexander fleming like left like his petri dishes out too long there were people developing antibiotics which basically had had the same idea behind them as this. So uh, the first antibiotics came from like dyes mm. because lots of people were looking under the microscope at, at, at bacteria and going, noticing, oh, lots of these dyes can dye bacteria. So what if we take these dyes and attach some a, a poison molecule to them? Then these dyes will be, get taken up by the bacteria and then they'd poison the cell. Yeah. And this kind of calls back to that very ancient theory <laughs> of antibiotics. So that's kind of like what stood out right. to me of that. Um, that it's like full yeah, it's circle. Like full circle. <laughs> in, in the technological going standpoint. all the way back yeah. to like Salvasan <laughs> and other like very old antibiotics that that didn't really work for the way anyone thought they were worked, but the, they somewhere out mm-hmm. because I think like like lots of the cell phone mines were discovered through di- through analyzing dyes, which is why a lot of like old like dye companies ended up going into like the biochemistry and kind of drug di- discovery industries. It's a weird sort of era of biology. Sure. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, I think because so much was very exciting about chemistry at that time, too. And now I think there's and now there's an equal excitement about chemistry because there's all these different computational methods that we can go about uh, designing chemicals. Right. I, I think that we've all we've touched on that as well. Right. Like seeing the machine learning discovery or whatever, um, like these chemistry is, again, something that uh, can be leveraged to get new new compounds. Yeah, so that's what kind of stood out to me about this paper. Uh, it is very biochemistry. It's looking yeah. into... So it's it's quite an interesting thing from that perspective. But I think we'll move on to the next one, which is linking plasmid-based beta-lactamases to their bacterial hosts using single-cell fusion P- PCR. Oh, yeah. This is something that I picked out. I thought it was an interesting one because um, we've talked a lot about uh, single-cell... like figuring out like what is out there in the environment, right? You have mm. to, uh, you usually blend it all up and then you can find like an inventory of everything that's out there. Then we've talked about like single cell sort of techniques. I think when we talked about the antibiotic screening, right? They like made single cell suspensions in oil, right? And each one had one microbe from that environment and you could screen, right? To see if that microbe was making some compound that you were interested in. Um, so here is another sort of related method, but actually doesn't need any of that microfluidics approach. Instead, they just make a emulsion of um, of these environmental microbes in oil. And so this is a like maybe um, we'll say an older technique, right, from the mm. microfluidics approach. But it was still a very viable way of getting single cells and single areas. And the reaction that they run inside of these droplets links the 16S region, so that's the barcode that we use in um, in uh, uh, phenotypic analysis, or phenotypic, <laughs> uh, uh, that we use when we're sequencing uh, microbes, 16S sequencing, and they fuse that to some gene of interest. So now when you go inside of a sample, 
or when you go inside of an environment, you can say, oh, it's these particular microbes that are make that are associated with this gene. And the system that they're using to study that they're studying in this particular instance is antimicrobial resistance. And they're trying to say, okay, well, we can use this technology to try to track where the antimicrobial resistance comes from and where it's going into which other organisms. <clears throat> and this is a really important thing because I feel like we do, there's a lot of like uh, metagenomics out there where they go, okay, there's this plasmid in the environment, but they can't necessarily relate it to what bacteria has it. And mm -hmm. it's like the equivalent of going, okay, we know that some people in this auditorium have guns, but are they the security guards or are they the festival goers? We don't know. And this technique <laughs> is basically does the equivalent of like figuring out and linking out like, okay, who has this antibiotic resistance gene and how is it, how is that going to be? So, cause if it's like in say something that doesn't affect humans, we don't necessarily care about it. But in this case, they find right. that, okay, they, they tend to be in kind of bacteria that do affect humans. Um, mm -hmm. So in, but uh, I think, yeah, monus? it's like, uh, that's the, this, that's the model system, but it's that technology, the ability to link things together um, and that application of it, I think is what I'm very excited about yeah. in terms of this paper. Yeah, because you can also imagine that over time you might be able to see like, where does this gene go, right? And then that might inform strategies that say, oh, well, we have to make sure that like these surfaces are cleaned at a certain amount or like maybe it identifies things that prevent the horizontal gene transfer. I don't know if that, those are technologies that really exist yet, but this would be the way of figuring out what's important to focus on. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just mm -hmm. good from the perspective of like, if we can adapt this technique to like look for the spread of d different plasmids and understanding how horizontal gene transfer works. Again, that's kind mm -hmm. of a very important thing that we don't really necessarily have a full understanding of how it works in the actual environment. So yeah, I think we, we know that genes get swapped all the time, but like, uh, yeah, can we observe some like early instances of it and then start building those stories of like, oh, it happened here because of this environmental concern maybe, and then it got selected for, yeah, this is a way to get at that, those, those stories. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and like thinking about like phages and out, out there in the world, I mean, if we, we can also study like how phages infect their hosts. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we can link up, we can see like which hosts are being infected with phages in that sample right at that point. So mm -hmm. I think this this uh, technique has a lot of potential. I'm quite excited about it. Yeah. Uh, but do you know, not as excited as some people about the next paper, which is called <laughs> Borgs, a giant extra chromosomal elements with the potential to augment methane oxidation. Um, <laughs> so I found this on Twitter because someone was proclaiming that this could be the next CRISPR. It could be, well, the quote was that it could be as important and as interesting as CRISPR, but it's probably just going okay. to be a new thing. So it's, uh, it might be <laughs> hyperbole, but I do quite, there's a lot here that is quite very interesting, I think. Um, so, okay, so uh, it seems like this is about another type of, uh, another type of DNA sequence, a big, they're big, they're fairly hmm. large, um, but they don't replicate by themselves. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, like, it's almost like the equivalent of finding, like, so we know about plasmids, we know about, like, v various viruses uh, almost form mm -hmm. extra chromosomes. This is, like, a massive genetic element that has just been discovered. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the the idea is uh, that I think they, they were trolling through some metagenomics and they found, uh, they, they found a way to put together certain genes to discover that actually there's been this kind of giant like chromosomal element that's been hiding a lot of data sets maybe um mm -hmm. so uh and they carry like lots of genes that are really important for meth so methane oxidation so i think the idea is that they're being like uh held by me methane pro producing uh, or digesting i can't remember um uh for various methane yeah. uh, act related bacteria um, which are, of course, very important for ecosystems as for global warming. We want to keep an eye on what those do, um, yeah. and they they are they're, they seem to be quite different. They lack the kind of proteins you'd expect from viruses or plasmids, and uh, and they do have like lots of things that are very essential to archaea. So, oh yeah, I forgot to mention these are mostly found in archaea. Um, archaea, mm -hmm. which are single cell organisms that aren't are more closely related to eukaryotes like us than bacteria <laughs> yeah uh they've found that they encode various things like CRISPRs. uh um they also find that they have like glycosyl transfer various genes evolved with dna and rna manipulation and lots of genes that we just don't know 
what they have what they do um yeah so a big part about this paper is that just is looking at the sequences yeah. right like they they found this very strange seemingly autonomous piece of genome yet it doesn't have the things that you would associate with a full organism so they're saying that it's probably uh, associated with the organisms it's close most closely related to like giant plasmids i guess they and they call them borgs why did they call I them borgs think <laughs> I, that just makes me think i of think star it literally trek. is because of star trek i think i, I saw like uh an interview that they basically like um i think they they said that it's because they assimilate into the genome okay, uh, okay. i mean gotcha the assimilation so, <laughs> the assimilation but i mean i feel like you say the same thing about plasmids and other things but i think the the big the big takeaway here that makes the things so, quite so exciting is that we don't know anything about them i think that's the uh thing that and because we don't know anything about them, we can project like our deepest desires onto them. So, <laughs> uh, which is actually it's part of the excitement of science is discovering something that no one's ever seen before. Yeah. And I can definitely feel that excitement. Like in, I can feel like how why the researchers are so excited about it. Um, because, uh, yeah, um, it could be really important. I mean, because one of the thing limits of CRISPR is like. How, the size of the things we can use it to insert, maybe, or I'd, again, I'm not quite sure, but, but I think I, I'm, I'm not really sure yeah. where the comparison with CRISPR comes in here necessarily. That's, that's but I think what the, I don't understand. Like, is it just like, is it because they're they seem to be able to have such a large amount of synthetic or not synthetic, but like you know, a large amount of extra chromosomal DNA in somewhere, but we have artificial chromosomes in different models. Um, I mean, this. To me, part of the importance of it is the fact that it seems like it has a lot of genes from a very specific lifestyle. So, like mm. that, this um, this might teach us more about these particular methano methanoparidins, right? That group of organisms yeah. that have these Borgs in them. Um, yeah, I don't <laughs> from the from the sort of fundamental way that it might inform. Uh, the way that we uh, engineer genomes, I don't see that that overlap as much. Yeah, I, I do know. That I did notice like one sentence of the paper saying that we can neither prove that they are archaeal viruses or plasmids or mini chromatons, nor can we prove that they are not. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's so, just like confusing giant DNA structures that have lots of genes, unknown functions. They're all related to each other. I think that's a big. Uh, part of the interest in them the fact that they're all related and there's a lot of different mm. uh no there's a, a lot of them which they give colors to distinguish so you got the steel borg and the lilac borg yes <laughs> um yeah i mean i think that like the fact that we don't i mean i mean if we found out that they, they are archaeal viruses or plasmids or mini chromosomes i don't think that would make them less interesting i think that would make them more interesting yeah so i think I, it would just be like what is this subset then of artificial or yeah archaeal chromosomes or viruses and what are they doing <laughs> why yeah what's their role so this is it? like very much uh, i mean yeah I, I can see like why the i can almost see the disappointment after the hype which is unfortunate because this even if it's like less interesting it can still be very important to discovery like basic science that you get discoveries like this all the time i mean for i think another comparison with crispr is the fact that crispr's were ignored for a very long time uh, because mm -hmm. they well, they were they didn't no one could see like their relevance or F, what what they could be used for and their potential right. and I think that's another thing that, that I think the the author really wants to uh, like yeah ex Keep, keeping an open yeah. mind about <laughs> the yeah. types of strange things you find in biology yeah <clears throat> yeah I mean mo and mostly I, I looked at this paper because because whenever the, a Nobel Prize winner publishes a paper after they've won the Nobel Prize, part of me wants to see whether they've, uh, they've acquired the Nobel d disease. I don't know if you've heard about this, but... No, what, uh, what, is, that? what is the Nobel disease? Oh, it's when like Nobel, a, a certain strain of Nobel Prize winner who once they win Nobel Prize starts to make crackpot like, claims about other things that aren't related. And it is so much fun when that happens. Like, uh, and, and like who, I mean... Who... Who is this? Who published this? Oh, oh, Jennifer, Jennifer Doudna uh, is one of the co-authors. Oh, uh, but maybe that's why they call it CRISPR, just because she's on it. But like, actually, it doesn't have anything to do. With 
I mean, we we don't know yet. That's that's yeah. the we, we're, we're unwrapping a package that looks like it could be a PS5, but we don't know yet, and we're hoping it is. <laughs> so okay, yeah, cool. that's so, this is something to keep an eye on for the future. I mean, it might be nothing, but if it is something, there's something big. <laughs> and you heard it here first. <laughs> yep, you definitely heard it here first. So remember that. So make people subscribe. Um, <laughs> Uh, next, microfluidic chips provide visual access to in situ soil ecology. So yeah, this such a weird. Is... So this was um, is fizz dot org is where I found this paper, and they called it cyborg soil. <laughs> was their like right. uh, catchy tagline to explain what's going on? Uh, but essentially, like um, I, they make uh, microfluidic chips as sort of a, a play- playground for different soil microbes to get into. Um, and they find that when they insert these these crazy shapes into uh, soil, different organisms prefer different areas. And that ends up being like a really useful way to study what's going on. Like what's the diversity of different organisms um, that, that, that live in the soil? Um, and I want to add, I want to predicate this with this uh, feast or famine sort of way people think about soil microbes in that they're there's so much in the soil and everything sort of waiting for the perfect environment for its its specific scenario. Um, and maybe what's going on with this technology is that when they put this in, there's a different shape for each organism's perfect scenario. And then you get you get to see right those organisms in action, um, taking advantage of these uh, physical characteristics. Yeah, I because I, I, it, it takes the idea because I mean this is the first paper that I've talked about soil where I'm actually interested in the soil microbiology itself rather than thinking mm-hmm. oh how can we make more antibiotics or how can we find more about <laughs> this is one I'm actually going oh yeah I never really thought about this because the way they talk about soil is let's think about soil as if it's a series of little spaces for bacteria to live in like little cave systems that that are microscopic yep. that bacteria live in and then they, they these shapes basically represent the, the different kind of shapes you can see in nature. And because of that, they can, they're, they're basically classifying the soil as this complex structure that we destroy whenever we try to analyze it. So they're trying to effectively replicate that structure to grow soil bacteria in. So it's, yeah, and they've created this roach motel for bacteria, which is really fascinating. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's interesting that they get to see all this different lifestyle, right? Because these organisms are in the soil, right? If you ground it up and you looked at it, if you... Uh, smeared the soil and you stained it these things are all there yeah but um something about providing that structure letting a very specific organism grow in that space is that insight that you know you don't have that you're destroying when you take samples in a certain way um and here again they don't know why these shapes right in Mm. some ways it's, it's just throwing things at the wall to see what happens but they try to they do say that they're informed on different things that they think could be found in the soil right yeah so in some ways we're limited by our imagination here in sort of what shapes might be and then test those shapes in this particular scenario to see what's happening yeah (laughs) a big part of microbiology is trying to figure out like how to keep microbes like in captivity how to keep them Mm -hmm. and this Mm -hmm. is another one of those papers that actually i feel like does quite a lot to try and replicate the a lot more to replicate the natural environment than most because most places that you yes you literally yes. just grind up the soil, take all the chemicals, and pop it on a plate. But this one actually tries to replicate the the structure of the soil, which I've never seen before, and that's kind of very interesting for me. Yeah, and uh, if you've been listening to our program before, we talked in one of our antibiotic discovery videos. We talked about this like eye chip technology, where you take little like single cells and you try to get them in a well and then cover it up and put it in the soil so that they can grow up in their single cells. This is a little bit of an extension on that as well, Hmm. right? It's another way of making a space, right? But this time in whole soil to let something get in there and maybe in that space it can concentrate the growth factors it needs to enter a certain developmental stage in its life or something like that. And that's something that you wouldn't have seen, right, in any other circumstance. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, this is like if this is quite an interesting like idea to look at because they are looking like at lots of different ba- like microbes, not just bacteria but fungi and other yeah. sorts of things. So this, yeah, it's quite. I an feel interesting... like they do a lot of fungi here. They're talking a lot about uh, of the fungi. Yeah, and we <laughs> right, haven't. So fungi have those little extensions. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah and we don't really talk about fungi too much on this show uh mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah um and that brings us to the last paper now you know i quite like single cell analysis that this is yes <laughs> that i have a slight weakness to to if <laughs> to, if, if there's a umap plot on it i'm i'm, I'm there um so this is uh, looking at absolutely tuberculosis where uh tuberculosis uh mostly well, when it enters the body it can it it predates on the immune system so it 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 tends to like try to get absorbed by macrophages so it can hide mm -hmm. inside macrophages so macrophages they they're the immune cells that like to eat stuff and then when it eats like a tuber tuberculosis instead of digesting it it kind of gets taken over by the tuberculosis and this yeah. uh, ba basically tries to analyze that try because obviously there's like a spectrum some macrophages can control tuberculosis infection so you have some people can have dormant tuberculosis because it's being kept under control and some can't and this one actually tries to look at that in detail by fluorescently tagging the the tuberculosis bacteria with a tag that tells them they can tell you whether the tuberculosis is feeling uh, okay. good or it's feeling upset and stressed and so if you've got like <laughs> macrophages that are making tuberculosis stressed out then that probably means that the, the, that they're doing their jobs because then tuberculosis mm -hmm. should not be at home inside your body um <laughs> and this single cell yeah. analysis but that's sorry oh no that's that seems really interesting because it's so hard i think one thing that comes up with tuberculosis infection always is what's adaptive for the body in one circumstance and what's adaptive for the tuberculosis because <laughs> it's obvious like there's some fight going on but some people say like oh it's good that the tuberculosis recruits these macrophages that's helping the tuberculosis survive or is it good for the body because that's sequestering it yeah um, and i think that getting this single cell resolution gets us closer to uh figuring out like where those divisions are between good and bad outcomes for the bacteria versus the body yeah and this like tells you they take they take uh macrophages from from mice and i think they correlate to the things that happen to you but most of this is mouse studies and most of it is looking mm -hmm. at the this looking at this workflow of you've got these glowing bacteria and you've got this like kind of output from the the genomes and so they they the correlate so i think that's the thing that interests me like way you can actually see the relationship between individual cells and the individual bacteria that infect them which we haven't really seen yeah. before and it, it yeah it it's so similar to the way that we've seen single cell applied inside of um inside of the malaria uh instance right yeah. where those malaria cells are going through all these different environments so they're changing right and sort of figuring out what's going on at each stage can help us understand more about the course of that disease and create interventions here it's like a pairwise thing right right we're seeing macrophages with tb in them but they can go in many different trajectories <laughs> developmentally speaking right they can go down a path where they get cleared out or they can go down a path where they uh, get a whole bunch of TB inside of them and understanding like what genes are going into those different populations is really really useful <laughs> yeah I think that sums it up so uh, I think it will be going to the final stage of this pick where we just sky we try to yeah. pick a winner which one do we want to talk about in future what do we want to talk about okay so uh, I, I like the soil micro the cyborg soil I think that that's something really interesting we haven't talked about fungi before um yeah so that's that should be on the docket yep so i was like uh, oh, yeah i'm up for the cyborg soil actually cyborg soil or the uh linking uh plasma based beta lactamases because uh, those are like oh linking yep those are two <laughs> techniques which i feel are can, they're really interesting in kind of what they say about microbiology and but i yeah I, i'm i'm here for the cyborg soil the cyborg soil i'm here for i I quite like the yeah. fungal roche motel. <laughs> Dive into some pictures and see how it's going. Should we talk about SARS? I don't know. We haven't talked about SARS so covid 2 in a while. Do people... <laughs> do you think this is something that we want to feed our audience? I mean, of the sars cov 2 papers, I feel like... Because um, uh, I, I, I feel like we've, we've covered quite a lot of sars cov 2 over the past, past year or so. I think we want to only cover like yeah. the papers that are going to be really kind of transformative. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. In some ways, we we've talked about the. There's one that's like about getting more uh, host range, but we've seen a lot of that, like <laughs> yeah, a convalescent serum versus um, uh, versus mutation. So yeah, I'm not feeling that necessarily. And the cardiomyocytes again, yeah, that's like a long list of different tissues and infects. But until we know the 
some more relevance or maybe it comes together in a tighter story um yeah i'm okay not talking about yeah. that one as well i mean the closest <clears> thing <throat> would be the i mean i feel like the the one that's like closest to our criteria is the transient stabilized complexes of nsp7 sp8 and nsp12 in sars cov2 replication mm. which uh delves yeah. quite deep into it but it is very biophysics and is like skating at the edge of my knowledge of of <laughs> so yeah well i was also thinking that one doesn't give us it it tells us what's happening in those cells but it doesn't give us a lot of the relevance attachments right right to like uh like how is that going to be how does that work inside of the sars cov2 infection exactly because they don't make any changes to the proteins they're just like finding the confirmations of those proteins uh in solution <laughs> yeah so i yeah i'm not sh sure about because okay I feel, yeah i feel like we would, we're now going to be focusing a lot because now we've all got, we got vaccines in our arms. We've we we kind of know a lot more about this, and I I feel like we're not going to cut like there's lots of people will be coming up with treatments now, but it's just going to be it's I'm not sure how relevant those will be. I think um, yeah yeah no I'm happy to just uh, do something non SARS CoV two for sure. I mean the these both the linking and the cyborg soil um, definitely piqued my interest a lot. So uh cyborg soil yeah cyborg soil so yeah we're basically <laughs> going moving towards more like broader microbiology now we're, we're not just a SARS-CoV-2 show because microbiology is much bigger than that now and and I think that, that there is going to be a lot I more I mean it always it always has been bigger yeah. but um yeah I think that like getting our thoughts out on the on the SARS-CoV-2 papers like sort of in these news cycles is like can be very helpful if something seems like it's going to have a huge impact on the way that we think about the virus like we'll definitely want to uh, deep dive it but for the most part unless we hear otherwise from our viewers well we might be choosing things that are outside of that realm for yeah our deep dives. I mean <laughs> I'm still looking out for papers on the SARS-CoV-2 and the gut story I mean that's a quite an interesting story that we need following up mm. on there's a couple of stories that we've been covering that we we want to like look, look at, especially in terms of long-term SARS and like SARS in the brain those are things that we that are quite interesting but sometimes there are yes. weeks where you don't don't see anything that particularly catches our interest um yeah okay so uh join us next week for our deep dive week where we will be covering uh microfluidic chips provide visual access to in situ soil ecology and we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, let us know in the comments. I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter with the hashtag MicroTWJC. We both believe that peer review is a process and that we can all participate in it. So we hope that you've all had a good time listening to us ramble on about microbiology today. If you think you have something to add or found something unclear, just let us know. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, Fuzz. <laughs> Tune in next week for more microbiology content.